Good morning, Oaks Community Church. We hope you are doing well uh, as we approach Christmas. Uh, my name is Brad Wilson, and I'm a member here at the Oaks, and I serve as an intern on staff during the weeks. The previous uh, three weeks of our Advent have focused our attention to three things, hope, peace, and love. And these come from the, the coming of Christ to the world. In this final week, we are focusing our attention to joy. We get a glimpse of joy in our lives as Christians with hope from what God has brought us out of, peace in the ways he is changing us into new people, and love because of our acceptance with him forever. And this final week of Advent is a call for joy because Christ is the fulfillment of things that humanity has longed for, and we get to be participants in hope, peace, and love that he brings. Receive this word from the Lord in Luke 1, 26 through 33 with joy. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end.
Psalm 26 is a special psalm. It is a really considered a song of ascent. And these were songs that the Israelites would sing as they were going to the temple during times of high holy days to offer sacrifices for their sins in the temple. And this Advent is a celebration of really the ascent of Christ. He came to worship the Father and give the ultimate act of worship that he accepted with joy. Hear this word from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. During this next song, let's take some time to pray in confession of our sins, which Christ died for. And be assured, as we pray, that though there's heartache in the world, weeping, sadness, our joy has been restored. And that Christ will call us home with shouts of joy when he comes again.
Hear this word from Luke 2, 8 through 12. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This proclamation of good news of great joy to the shepherds that was given is the same good news that is for us today. Our plea for today, for all of you at home, where you, wherever you are, at work, with your kids, your families, is that you would be a people marked with joy, that this season of Advent would be a season of joy at the coming of our Lord and our Savior, and what it means that he will come again with great joy. So the calling for us all is to consider what it means for you to be a participant in this good news of great joy in your family, your relationships, and your community. May we be a people marked with joy.
Hey church, good morning. I'm Pastor Eric and I'm one of the pastors here at the Oaks Community Church. Real quick before we dive into the text and the sermon this morning, I want to direct your attention to a video that Pastor Matt uh, you know, announced a couple of days ago. There was a video announcement um, that should have gone out on, I think, Facebook or our app. Uh, if you haven't seen that announcement yet, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video that will take you to that video uh, so you can see the announcement. It, it's it's uh, in regards to a couple of dates coming up uh, where we're going to be doing kind of some alternative activities in lieu of a couple of services. So it's really important because if you miss those details, you're going to be tuning in to, to watch uh, the regular service and then not find it and wonder what's going on. We have some other uh, things planned for you guys, so make sure to check out that video announcement again from Pastor Matt. Link in the description of this video so you can get filled in on, on all of those details. Okay, so we're diving in back into the book of Matthew as we go through our sermon series uh, in Matthew. And, in to, and today we're in Matthew 22, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. So uh, let, let's just go ahead and dive into this text. It's, it's got some weird things going on, and we'll get to all of that, but let's just get through the text here today, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, the man, was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen." This is the word of the Lord. So, super weird passage, right? It, it starts with a wedding invitation or a wedding call, and the guests don't come. So, and then they kill uh, the they kill the the servants who are trying to get them to come to the wedding, and then the king, you know, retaliates and kind of kills them. Then they fill up the room full of stranger guests, and then. One of those guests is bound and hogtied and thrown out into the streets. Super, super weird parable. It's like, what in the world is going on? So hopefully here today we can, number one, make sense of what's going on in this text, uh, but more importantly, learn something about the kingdom of heaven. Because when Jesus starts this story, this parable, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So that in and of itself is just interesting that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like a huge party, a, a massive royal celebration. So it's the king's son's wedding. The king is throwing the wedding party celebration. And just so we can kind of understand the story a little bit more clearly as we progress here today, um, most theologians believe that the king in this particular parable represents God and that his son represents Jesus and that those who are initially invited represent those in the Jewish community or at the very least the Jewish religious elites. So that will kind of help uh, frame in uh, the original significance of the parable to the listeners and then we will, with that understanding, kind of 
see how it also definitely applies to us as well. So in this text, Jesus goes on to describe three things. There's three things that we see in this text. We see the call, the covering, and the celebration. Three C's, the call, the covering, and the celebration. So let's just go ahead and jump into the call. So the call is first extended to guests who had already been invited according to the text. These guests had already been given some sort of formal invita invitation, and they knew what the king, what God, in this, in this parable, what the king was up to. They were in on his plans. Um, they would have already received the invite. They should have already have been prepared. But then when these servants show up to say, hey, it's, it's time to come to the wedding. You guys haven't shown up. Come on, it's time to go. Uh, they refused to go. They ignored the call. Uh, it says that, you know, they ignored him. They, one went off to work on his farm. Uh, the other went to conduct some business. Uh, but there wasn't any time to bother with the celebration. They were all snubbing the invite that they had uh, been given. And in fact, Jesus says in verse 6, as we just read, that some of the people seized his servants and uh, abused them and then killed them. And uh, what this is likely referring to is Jesus is, is referencing the way that Old Testament prophets were often treated. Um, just for those of you who are biblical nerds, it's like, what is going on there? Why are, they, why are they killing the servants? Well, it's likely that Jesus was referencing Old Testament prophets who warned uh, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and the, the religious elites oftentimes, uh, but to no avail. They were often persecuted or even killed. And so, um, so to sum it up, those who were originally invited decided to disrespect the king, at the very least. Some of them just ignored it and went and did something different, and then some actually were, were violent. So the king essentially says, okay, well then never mind those guests. He says in verse 9, go therefore to the main roads, the roads, the streets, and invite the wedding feast, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. So the servants went out to the roads, to the streets, gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. So this is interesting. The king then decides, you know what? Ignore those previous guests that I invited. I'm going to open up this invit invitation, the call, to whoever really wants to come. Both the bad and the good are called and brought. Both morally good people and morally bad people. People from the roads, it says. Not, you don't typically go out to the streets and just pick up random people off of the street for your uh, you know, wedding celebration, but that's what was, was taking place. In Luke 14, there's a, there's a parallel text to, to this uh, text here in Matthew. Uh, there's a parallel text where Luke's version of this same uh, parable, the same story, he says, streets and alleys, interesting, uh, bring the poor, crippled, blind, and lame. That's all from Luke 14. So the marginalized of society, those who didn't have wealth, those who were poor, uh, those who were crippled, blind, and lame, those who had disabilities, who would have been marginalized in their society. So Jesus is essentially saying, listen, change of plans for the wedding. I'm going to go ahead and call everyone. Everyone's invited. Whoever wants to come can come, but especially the marginalized. Uh, everyone's invited, but especially the marginalized. And this is an interesting call. It runs completely against the grain of, of how we operate. Who do we tend to call to our wedding party? Our closest friends, our family. Um, it's expensive. A wedding is expensive. Right? When, you're, when you are planning out your wedding, uh, there's a little bit of sticker shock sometimes when they hand you the per plate or per person cost of what it's going to cost for each individual uh, person. It's expensive. And so we heavily discriminate on who shows up at our weddings when we put our list together. We invite our closest friends and family. And honestly, some people don't make the cut, right? Some people just don't. We discriminate heavily. The king in this story seems to have room for whoever is willing to show up. 
And, and, and again, in fact, in Luke's telling of this parable, he says, uh, the servants say to the king, hey, we've invited everybody and we still have more room. So in Luke's version, he says, okay, well then go back out. And if you can't find any more people in the city streets, then start to go into the countryside and find whoever is out in the country. I mean, just, just keep going. Just keep going until we fill this place up. Everyone's invited. So the, the king is inviting all these people. And unlike us, who discriminate heavily for our wedding celebrations, the king is inviting people who have zero reason to be there. The call is given to people who have zero reason to be there. Some of them, per Jesus' own words, are bad people, poor people, marginalized people with disability, with disease. The king's call is, therefore, a complete extension of grace. There is nothing in themselves that would make the king want to have to invite them. They have zero reason to be there. They don't know the king. They might be bad people. They might be poor. They might be marginalized. Nothing nothing in the guests warrants a call, and yet they get it. It's a complete extension of his grace. And really what the the call says more about the king than it does the guests. None, None of the guests can say, well, I'm here because the king and I, we're pretty close. We're pretty tight. Or, you know, I'm here because the king values my contributions to the kingdom so much. So that's why I was called to the wedding. None of that. None of that. There's zero reason why any of them should be there. The king should not have called any of them, and yet he did. And so the call reflects more on the grace nature of the king than it does the guests. Here's what the call essentially communicates from the king. Welcome to a kingdom where it's not about merit. It's about mercy. It's mercy over merit. It's grace over what you've earned. That is what the king is communicating. He's he's essentially communicating my love for the people. My love for the guests is not contingent on what kind of people they are or have been. That I, I, my, the call is an extension of grace. Let me reframe the idea of calling in a way that I actually think um, many of you will understand because you've experienced it or, or seen it in our church. Uh, adoption. Adoption. Uh, many in our church, actually a surprising number of, of just in general Christian families that I know have chosen to adopt. And if I may kind of toe a line a little bit and be so bold, many of you have chosen to adopt children that otherwise would have been in the margins had it not been for your adoption. They would have been in the margins based on Uh, the color of their skin, or physical needs or disabilities, but you chose to adopt them anyhow, not based on who they were, but because you had love in your heart for whoever your child would be. That is the nature of the call. It's, It's it's more akin to an adoption call, right? It's, it's not about merit. It's about mercy. It's not about earning it. It's about grace. And here's the thing about every Christian, every Christian that I know. Every single one of you knows that there is something outside of yourself that was inviting, that was pressing, that was calling, that was compelling, for some of you, that call maybe happened in a moment, right? You heard, you heard the, the good news, the gospel of Jesus coming and dying for your sins on the cross, shedding his blood for us to pay for our sins so that we could enjoy having a relationship uh, with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the rest of eternity. You heard that good story, that good news and in a moment, you were, you were so compelled by it that that, that, that calling 
uh, kind of took place in a moment. And then for others of you, that same calling and compelling and drawing took place over years, years and years, right? You may, you may have resisted the calling as, as best as you could. You tried to kind of maybe fight against it, but there was just something so compelling about it. And here's, the, here's my point. Every true Christian will tell you that the call in and of itself is, is something outside of yourself, that there is, there's a miraculous kind of draw. Theologians have called it irresistible grace. That's the call. It's, it's an irresistible grace. It's something that's so beautiful, so sweet, so undeserved that you can't help yourself, that you're just drawn to it. Even if you find yourself resisting, you're, you're compelled, you're drawn to it. Every Christian will tell you that that is what the call is. For every Christian, the call is an act of mercy, not of merit. It's not about earning it. It's, being, it's, it's compelled in the grace nature of the call. So that's the first thing that we see here, that this, this call um, is given to the rich and the poor. It's given to the healthy and the sick. It's given to the good and the bad. That it's, that it's about mercy and not about merit. So that's the first thing. But then all of that is called into question with the actions of the kings of the king when we see what happens next. We, we get to the covering. So we have the call, and now we have the covering. And, we, and at a first read, it seems like the, the mercy nature almost dissolves, and it suddenly becomes about merit, because this is what it says in verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. What is going on here, Jesus? Jesus is telling the story and it's like, oh, this is a beautiful story about people of, of all races, of all economic standing, of, of, of all moral standing, being, being invited to the wedding, not based on who they are, but based on the grace nature of the king. It's about merit. It's about grace. This is wonderful. And then suddenly we have the king totally doing a 180 and throwing out a guest who's not dressed appropriately. What is going on? I almost wish that we could spend a whole week just talking about this one point because um, there's so much uh, there's so much Old Testament like history rooted in this. Like it harkens all the way back to when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and uh, and God creates a covering for them to cover their shame. Like this idea of a covering or a garment or something that covers you. This goes. This is like just all throughout. This is a thread through all throughout the Old Testament. So Jesus is kind of. Uh, tying into that, that Old Testament thread. Uh, and so we could talk about that in a whole other sermon, but we got it for time's sake, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving forward. What's going on here between this man and the king? It seems really harsh, right? Uh, well, similar to our time, uh, you know, back then, ro especially royal weddings would have required the most expensive of garments, uh, even the average wedding to, in, to, in our society today, and in most societies throughout the world, even just the average wedding uh, demands that there is a, a kind of dressing up. Uh, but a royal wedding, or the wedding of someone rich and important, even more so. Even more so. If I'm invited to the wedding of someone really important, a royal wedding, or a celebrity wedding, let's say, I'm probably going to wear the nicest, most expensive clothes I can find in my closet. And if I don't own nice clothes, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy them. And if I can't afford to buy them, then I'm going to go out and rent them. And if I can't afford to rent them, then I'm going to go find someone who's got them so maybe I can borrow them. But if I get invited to a royal wedding or a celebrity wedding, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be dressed for the occasion. Why? Why? Because a wedding is a holy event. 
It's set apart. It's special. It's not routine. Uh, it's one of the ways in which we set apart the occasion of a wedding. It's, it's by ramping up our standards for everything. At, at a wedding, you ramp up your standards for the food. You ramp up your standards uh, for the, the, the wine. The expense of everything is ramped up, um, even the clothes that we wear. And so the king asks the man, why aren't you wearing wedding garments? And a couple of answers actually wouldn't have been unreasonable. There's a couple of rational, reasonable things that the man could have said. Um, he could have said, well, I didn't have time to go get my clothes. I was literally walking out on the streets and your servants came up and they got me and I was literally picked up off the street corner and brought straight here. I didn't have time to go home and change. That would have been a reasonable answer. Um, or he could have said, well, you know what, King? I'm a, I'm a man of humble means. I'm a poor man, and to be quite honest with you, the clothes that you see on my back, that's all I own. That I don't have any clothes at home. I, this, is the, this is the best that I've got. I, I brought and, and wore the best that I, that I possibly have. Those would have been a couple of reasonable responses. But two things tip us off in the text here, that something more subversive is going on. That, that something maybe even kind of sinister is going on. The first thing is that the man stays silent. This, this was uh, put there by Jesus to indicate that this guy doesn't have a reasonable response. So he offers none. There's, there's no reason that the man can offer up for why he's not dressed appropriately. And so he doesn't have an answer. He stays silent. And then the second thing that tips us off is that only this man was, was picked out of the crowd in, in contrast with everyone else who was there who was also picked up off the streets and poor and didn't have any clothes as well. And so somehow all of the other party attenders got the proper covering, the proper clothes, and were dressed appropriately, but not this guy, meaning and implying, as Jesus is doing here, that the wedding garb is provided. And that would have been an understanding of the people that were originally listening to this. That was the case for a royal wedding. A king, especially a wealthy king, would not leave it up to chance that his guests, especially poor guests, would show up wearing the proper attire. And so the king would often provide... Uh, at their own cost, great cost, the garments for the guests. Just in the same way that Adam and Eve were covered by God and they were provided the covering by God, in the same way so were all of these guests. All at the king's great cost, he had provided all of the wedding garments for the guest. And so this man, when he showed up in his blue jeans and t-shirt off the street, would have been offered these garments, these, what, these appropriate garments, but he shunned them. That's what is taking place here. Why? Why? Well, for no good reason. For no good reason. In fact, it was probably something subversive or even disrespectful. So either the man had a total disregard for the standards of the king, and it was a pure act of disrespect uh, for the sanctity of the party, the, the, the uh, special nature of the occasion, or he was delusional enough to think that his street clothes would be good enough for a king, that they would be good enough to fit in, that his blue jeans and t-shirt would just seamlessly blend in with the crowd of expensive dresses and tuxedos. Either way, he was rejecting the king's covering. Either way. He was declaring rebellion. Notice that he, notice that he doesn't even say to the king, listen, king, I apologize. I was out of line. Um, I will immediately go and change. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry for disrespecting you in this way. I thought that maybe my blue jeans and t-shirt would have been good enough. 
I'm seeing now that your standards are very high. And so I'm going to go change. He, he could have said that. But I think at the end of the day, he probably just had total disrespect, disregard for the king's standards. He stays silent because he is dis, disrespectfully challenging the king's standards and thinks to himself, I don't care about these standards. I want it my way. I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. And he has really uh, turned and is attempting to turn the wedding to being about himself and his own desires and what he wants rather than submitting to the standards of the king and what the king wants for his son. So he's turned, he's turned the wedding to be about himself rather than the son. And the king is going to have none of it. Nobody is going to be a party pooper at this wedding celebration. And so the man who shows up with the intent to either subvert the party or make the party about himself to show disrespect to the other guests or to the son or to the king, he's cast out. No party poopers. Now, that makes a lot of sense to us on one level, right? That just makes some sense. But on the other hand, it still seems to contradict the point that Jesus was making earlier about the kingdom being a place where both the good and the bad are called. It's like, wait a second, Jesus, is this about mercy or is this about merit? I thought it was about mercy, but then you're kicking out this guest who behaved badly. So what gives? So yes, Jesus, Jesus accepts anyone where they are, and whoever they are. Jesus accepts anyone, wherever they are, and whoever they are. But what's the covering symbolizing? Again, the covering has its roots in the Old Testament. Um, Old Testament sacrifices, a blood covering made for sins. In the New Testament, we see um, that this idea of a covering is pointing to Jesus, ultimately. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross where he would make a once and for all covering for sin with his own blood. This is where Christians get the term, this idea of covered in the blood. This idea that Jesus' sacrifice is the covering, uh, that it covers our sins. But here's what we have to understand about the covering, that it doesn't just cover our past, present, and future sins. The covering doesn't just cover up our, all of our sin. The covering must also be transfigurative. It changes us. It has to change us. In the same, so in the same way that Jesus was transfigured into sin, it changed the way that Jesus it changed at his essence who he was and how he appeared to the extent that when Jesus took on sin and became sin for us, he was so transfigured, so different, that the Father had to turn away. The Father had to turn his back on Jesus so that in Jesus' covering, we are also transfigured. There's not just a covering for our sin, but it changes our appearance, the way that we look, who we are at the core, the way that the Father looks at us now is changed. We appear different. We are transfigured. So essentially what Jesus is saying here with this idea of the covering is that, yes, God accepts you just as you are, but he's not going to leave you just as you are. God accepts you just as you are, but he's not going to leave you just as you are. If you submit to the call, you're also submitting to the covering. So it's not that you earn your place, but it's also not that you stay the same. I mean, let's be real here for a moment. If you're a real Christian who has submitted to the call, the calling of Jesus, you, you've, you recognize that it's, that it's grace, that it's mercy, that you're you can be a Christian in the first place. Do you really, though, just want God to say, cool, that's enough. I'm going to leave you 
as you are now? Like, I'm done with you? Is that really what you want? No. My goodness, no. Man, there are sins and thoughts and stuff in my life that I want to be changed. I don't want to be the same. I want to be changed. I want to be covered. I want to appear different. I want to be different. If you just want to remain just as you are, what you're demonstrating is that you've never actually accepted the covering of Christ. Someone who's truly a Christian doesn't want to remain in their sin. They're frustrated by their inability to overcome their sin. It's this constant inward battle for them. And so what Jesus is saying is that, hey, in the kingdom of heaven, you get, you're in for free. No matter who you are, what your background is, you're in for free. And get this, my mercy doesn't even stop there. My grace doesn't even stop there. You're going to be changed. I'm going to provide for you at my great cost a covering for you. So there it is again, right? The covering isn't actually some sort of merit. It's an additional grace. You're invited to the party for free, but moreover, you don't, you're provided with a covering. You're provided with a garment. You're going to be changed. You're not going to be left in the rags, in the filth that you came in with. You're going to be cleaned up at my cost, is what the king is saying. Again, this is another radical um, a radical extension of mercy and grace. And what Jesus is saying to us as Christians, and this should be great news, is, hey, you're in, but not only that, you will no longer have to wear the rags of sin. You will no longer, you will get to, to instead wear the robes of righteousness provided by my son at great cost. This is wonderful news that the gospel rids us not only of our sin, but will ultimately change us so that we will Bear the image of sin no more. It will be gone. It will be wiped out. We will be transformed by the covering. So this is, a, this is unreal, like, right, right? We have this gracious calling, this gracious covering. And then lastly, we have what the whole thing is about in the first place, the celebration, the celebration. Now, Jesus actually doesn't give us a whole lot of details about the celebration, he leaves a lot, up to the, a lot up to the imagination. And the closest that he gets uh, is really just the verse 2. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And that's, that's about it. Uh, we, we have to really kind of go to other biblical passages to kind of fill in some of the blanks. So Revelation 19, uh, verses, uh, what is it, 7 through 9, it says this. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Again, this, this narrative of a covering. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we don't get a lot of specifics, but we get just enough that the kingdom of heaven is going to be like the biggest party you've ever been to. No expense spared. The finest foods, the best music, ridiculous accommodations, the best clothes, wine unfit for mere mortals, choirs of angels by the thousands. And it's at this kind of celebration, the most epic party, the most epic wedding celebration ever, that you and I are going to gaze out over the, the guests. And we're going to see beggars, and we're going to see thieves, and we're going to see liars, we're going to see the poor, we're going to see the disabled, we're going to see people from every nation and every tongue, and we're going to see people of which none have the right to be there. And then we begin to see the intent of the king towards his guests. It was for the glory of his son. This is true. 
It's for the glory of the Son, but it's for our joy. For the glory of the Son, but for our joy. The guests are saying to themselves, yesterday I was begging in the streets, and today I'm eating at the king's table. Uh, The pastor, Charles Spurgeon, in the 1860s, preached a sermon on this text. Um, And he said something to the effect of, and I'm going to have to summarize it here, but he said something to the effect of that there's a reason why Jesus tells stories about the homeless and beggars being invited to, uh, to these parties. There's a reason why Jesus says, hey, when you have a feast, when you have a celebration, when you have a dinner, invite people who are poor and broke and disabled and in the margins of society. Spurgeon says there's a reason for all of this. He says, you know, prim and proper people, they watch as the dishes come in, all of the, the meals, the food, the wine, they watch as it all comes in, and they say to themselves, hmm, with, a nose in the, with their noses in the air, they kind of say, hmm, right? But the beggars cheer for every dish. Oh my goodness, look at that. Look at the bread. Look at the butter. Look at this wine in my cup. Wait, that's not, there's more? There's, that's just the first course? Oh my goodness, there's, oh, look at this salad. Look at this, look at this main entree. This, this is the biggest filet I've ever seen. This is beautiful. This is amazing. The, the beggars, the poor, those who have no reason to be there, cheer. It's a celebration with every bite, with every dish. Nobody has more fun at the party than those who feel like they crashed it. That's the joy of the Christian, see? The idea that I I was actually invited, me. And I'm not going to wear something that just masks me. I'm getting to wear something that changes me to the core, who I am. I get to walk a different way now. I'm a different person. And then I'm going to sit down at the king's table and celebrate for the rest of eternity It's a beautiful text. Uh, The call, see the call, the call shows us that there's pardon for the past. The covering shows us that there's renewal for the present. And the celebration points to the glory and joy of the future. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful text. So what's the application for us today? If, if these words are true, and they are, what is the application? Let me, let me say it this way with an illustration, with another parable, if you will. Back in the early days of the Oaks, uh, some of you remember some of the early days of the Oaks. Um, it seemed like there was a wedding twice a week for about four year, For about a four-year stretch, there was like a wedding like at least once or twice a week, like everybody was getting married. Uh, But even before all of that snowball wedding thing transpired, uh, there were a few of you that a few of you that were kind of the first, you know, the first few in the church to get married. And uh, and I can remember those days. Amber and I uh, had come to the church after it had been maybe going on for about a month. Uh, You guys had only been meeting for about a month, and then Amber and I showed up and, and joined the church and have been here ever since. And uh, I can remember we were trying to kind of reach out and make some friends with some people and, um, and try to, you know, get plugged into the community. And uh, one of the first individuals that I kind of befriended was Mike Pruitt, my buddy Mike Pruitt. Um, and I didn't know him great. I knew him pretty, you know, pretty well. But I was kind of honestly surprised when um, Amber and I were invited to, the, to his wedding, to Mike and Reba's wedding. I was, I was kind of surprised because we were still fairly new at the church. But we were thrilled. We were thrilled to attend. But we were also broke and poor. But here's the thing. Mike knew that we were broke and poor. Uh, Mike knew that there wouldn't be some sort of large check in the wedding card Uh, or any check at all, if I'm honest. Mike knew that there was nothing I could contribute uh, with my presence being at the wedding. Um, So 
the invitation, the call from Mike and Reba Pruitt for us to be there at the wedding was a reflection of their grace, right? We had no reason uh, to be there at all. Uh, it, was, it was a pure refre- reflection of their love and grace towards us. Um, and Amber and I were used to uh, stuffy Baptist weddings that we had attended in the past, where uh, certainly dancing and alcohol was prohibited. Um, food was often subpar. Um, I, I know that for Amber and I, we weren't even allowed to have uh, sparkling grape juice at our wedding because it was, you know, the appearance of evil. Um, so basically, uh, the, all the weddings that we had been to uh, were no fun or joy allowed, <laughs> okay? No fun or joy allowed at the previous weddings. So we get to this wedding of Mike and, and Reba Pruitt. I think it was our first, I'm pretty sure it was our first Oaks wedding. And we were like, wow, these people know how to party, right? The food is actually good. The drinks are on the host. The drinks are free. So, man, we cut loose, Amber and I. And, in fact, I'm going to show you guys some photos from that night. So the Pruitt's wedding for Amber and I was a stark contrast to, you know, the weddings we had been at before. It wasn't just a holy event. It was. It was a holy event, but it wasn't just a holy event. For us, it was a party, too. And what is the proper response at a wedding? What what would be the proper response for Amber and I as we attend that wedding? What does the alcohol help you do? It helps you forget about yourself and celebrate, right? That's that's the proper response of a guest at a wedding. Forget about yourself for a moment and just celebrate the wedding. Celebrate it. Have fun. Forget about yourself. And, you know, I've been to many weddings now at the Oaks, and I've seen some of your dance moves at weddings. Uh, Many of you have some dance moves. And let's just put it this way. You have to really forget about yourself, forget your pride, right? Uh, To be willing to dance like many of you that I've seen dance on the dance floor, right? But that's also how you celebrate the best. When people begin to kind of forget a little bit of their inhibitions, when when they forget about themselves a little bit and just kind of lean into the celebration of the moment, those are the best weddings, right? Because it's not about you, right? That's, that's the whole point of the celebration. It's not about you. It's about the beauty and the moment that you're enraptured in. You have no time to think about bitterness or anger or pride or greed, and therefore you have nothing impeding your joy. But instead, I mean, right, that's the proper response to a wedding. Forget about yourself. Forget about yourself for a moment, and, and then nothing is impeding your joy. But instead, many of us show up at the kingdom of heaven's wedding party, or I think will show up at the kingdom of heaven's wedding party, holding on to bitterness, anger, envy, strife, some of those, some of those emotions and, and thoughts towards some of the other wedding guests, Bitterness towards the other wedding guests. Anger towards the other wedding guests. Envy, strife towards the other wedding guests. You've hijacked your own joy. You've showed up at a a wedding uh, to be the party pooper. As though you're entitled to something. As though you deserve to be there and the other guests don't. Listen, your joy isn't tied to your circumstances. I'm not talking about happiness, right? I'm not, your happiness can come or go like the breeze. I'm talking about deep inward joy. The sense that no matter what happens, all is going to be well. That isn't tied to your circumstances, right? Joy's not tied to your circumstances. It's, it's tied to your standing in Christ. You've been invited. You've been called. You've been covered. So now... It's time to celebrate. It's time to let go of the bitterness, the pride, the things that sap your joy. The finished work of the cross, the covering, 
must be finished in your heart too. Right? We have a party we have to begin dressing for. We have a party to get ready for. Like imagine if Amber, or Amber and I had showed up after Mike and Reba extended this gracious invitation to us. And we had showed up and we were bitter. Mm. We never got a cool wedding like this. You know what, Amber? Look at all the fun that they're having. We never had fun like that at our wedding. And uh, why are we seated here, right? We're seated with Cousin Eddie uh, at our table. I want to be seated at the cool table. Why am I here? Right? <laughs> That's how to hijack joy, not experience it. Let's and so turn away. Turn away from your bitterness. The calling for us as Christians is to turn away from the bitterness, anger, the unhealthy obsession with ourself and what we're entitled to, and instead turn towards the joy of the master. Let's begin, ready. Let's begin in this life. Let's not wait for the life to come to begin getting ready for the party. Let's begin getting ready for the party and getting in that celebratory mindset today. Let's pray. Father, I'm, I'm thankful that you have called us and that you have covered us. These are things that I think as a, as a church we, we recognize often, um, but then I think that we forget that your intention for us is yes, to bring glory to your son and glory he deserves, but we also forget that it's for our joy. I think we often... Um, we lose sight of this, of this um, party mentality that you would have for us. Um, and if there's ever been a year where it's been hard for us to remember that, it's definitely been this year. I'm thankful for the grace nature of your call, for the mercy and grace that you give to us with your covering. And... Lord, by your grace, help us to let go of our bitterness. Help us to let go of our anger, um, our envy, our jealousy, the contentions that we have, the fighting that we have with other people. Help us to let go of that so that we can lean into joy, the joy that you have for us, the joy of the master, the joy of the king, so that we can um, celebrate Father, I thank you for sending your son. This is uh, the time of year where we remember that, and we're so thankful that you've sent Jesus um, to die in our place. We're thankful for the call. We're thankful for his covering. And Father, I can't wait to be there at the wedding and to celebrate, to see you, to see Jesus, and to see all of my brothers and sisters and celebrate. Lord, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Receive this benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Peace be with you.